Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to APSCA's 2022 annual meeting for members and stakeholders. I'm Rona Starr, I'm the president and CEO, and I wanna thank two Vineland who are hosting us this week for having us here in Cologne. And as Frank said, for the second time in our seven year um, AGM history. It's great to be back in person with each of you. And we're really excited about the number of online participants that we have. As of this morning, we had over 1,250 people that have actually signed up to participate. So it's almost double what we've ever had um, in each year, and particularly the last couple of years where we have done um, all remote um, and offered in numerous, in numerous different time zones. So we're really excited about the participation this week. Thanks very much. We're also recording these sessions as we recognize everybody can't tune in at the same time. Um, so we wanna make sure that everybody can participate and have the same opportunity to raise questions. Um, to further to support that, we have a Slido, we're using Slido. So whether you're in the room or you are acting remotely, please scan the QR code. Within Slido, there'll be an opportunity to post questions and there'll also be an opportunity to participate in a few polls that we have. If you are listening to the recording, obviously this is for later. If you are listening to the recording and you have any questions, please email the director at theapska.org. We do wanna make sure that we have everybody's um, participation and that we can answer your questions. Before I go and introduce our host, um, this year's theme is transforming the future of social auditing. How do we transform that future? I wanna take a moment and just quote Harriet Tubman who was born into slavery in 19th century America and became a leading American social activist. Tubman said, with every great dreamer begins with, with every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have with you the strength, the patience and the passion to reach for the stars and to change the world. Together we can, and we have been transforming the future of social auditing and we continue to reach for the stars to help change the world for a better. I look forward to the various panels we have today um, as we continue to learn and also talk about how we, how we can and how we're engaging with others about transforming. So I'm gonna hand over to Frank Dorser um, with Two Vrindland, who are, as I said, general, generously hosting us here this week. Two Vrindland has been a founding member of ABSCA and Frank is one of two um, executive board members who were, who were founding members and as an individual was also on that original group and still sits on our executive board today. Frank is also our, or has been our secretary in the past and is currently on our finance committee. So I'm gonna hand over to Frank. Thank you, Rona. Um, yes, as Rona said, we've been a founding member since 2015. And um, it's been very clear that TUV Rhineland would support this initiative to enhance the professionalism and social compliance, because the topic in itself is uh, seen as a, as a critical and important topic for TUV Rhineland to not only carry out the artists, but also to uh, perform them and help shape this, uh, this profession. Um, I've been counting on the support of my uh, board to uh, participate, and as Rona said, I've been doing this since seven years. And uh, one of the early supporters was then also our CEO, Mr. Dr. Fubi, and um, I would like to welcome him for an, an opening statement. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, good morning, dear participants here in the room, but also um, online. I, it's really a big pleasure for me to, to welcome you here. And uh, as Frank mentioned, I've been supporting uh, the initi initiative right from, from the beginning. And uh, the reason is very simple. For us as TÜV Rhineland, uh, our five values, the first of us is integrity. And that's all about APSCA. And uh, I can tell you, we have made in our um, strategy, in our CSR strategy, big stakeholder analysis. We have uh, in, interviewed a lot of people and asked them, what is the most important in all the CSR aspects that you as stakeholders expect from us as major player in the tick industry? And the answer was quite simple. Deliver high quality services. Integral services. That's the biggest part that you as tick player can do to support the sustainability of the world. And this is something which is not just 
we, when we as TÜV Rhineland listen to our stakeholders, but that's also what we, and uh, now I'm talking a little bit maybe also about TIC Council, as uh, I'm also uh, running right now as president of the TIC Council, the association of all uh, the TIC companies. Um, when we sit together there with the CEOs, that's exactly the discussion we're having, how to protect our, our brands, how to ensure a high quality service. And when we talk about it, and I can, can talk about the last board meeting we just had a few months ago with uh, the major 20 CEOs sitting around the table. The major topic was ESG. The major topic was CSR audits where we talked about, because this is a field where we specifically see a higher risk profile because it's individuals, individual auditors going to individual companies and looking at it and being there at a point in time, but not always. It's a different thing if we test a product, uh, a refrigerator or something like this. This is a solid product which you can test and which is not changing from day to day. But the social standards within a company can be changed, you can be cheated. And that's why it's so important. And also talking to the politicians globally, either in the US, but also in Europe, but also in other markets, they always push for higher due diligence in the supply chain. And if they do so, they want to push the responsibility to the companies who are buying in those areas. And then of course, those companies look how to insure it. And then they come to the tick industry. Then they look for reliable auditors and they look for reliable companies and they look for reliable schemes. And that's why I, right from the beginning, pretty much supported the founding of EBSCA with the, with the main, with the essence of it. For us at TÜV Rhineland, we are working with more than 20,000 people um, globally and uh, in various business fields, industrial services, mobility, products testing, um, but also in a major part where Andreas Höfer is heading our division for uh, system certification, where we do the normal ISO certifications, but also particularly looking at uh, customized audit and, and uh, also at social audits. So this is a topic which we as company and particularly also I as CEO really have um, in mind looking forward when you talk about also our, our responsibility for the world, for a more sustainable world. And that's why I'm happy to host you here. That's why I'm happy to see that there are so many attendants online and, uh, and, and here in person to discuss how to further improve or not improve, but ensure the integrity. And I draw a little bit the comparison to that what has been in TIC Council, which was formerly IFIA part of it, and, and also the European Association when it was merged. IFIA was founded some years before APSCA for the pretty much the same reason, to ensure the integrity of the auditing schemes at that point in time, mainly in petroleum. And that's why IFIA at that point in time has established a scheme where all auditors need to be checked and get then just the permission by IFIA. And if they are IFIA certified, then they will be ordered by the clients. So this is somewhat an industry standard that has developed by this. This is hosted um, today um, by TIC Council. And it was a success factor because there was scrutiny on the industry where a lot of players said, okay, we see different quality levels and this is not acceptable. We want to rely on this industry and therefore in this industry, we need to have a dedicated high quality level to ensure the integrity. And in TIC Council, it's also to become a member there, you need to have a compliance code. And this compliance code is checked on a regular basis that it's really fulfilled. And that's what I'm saying. That's so important that you as EBSCA are working together to define the standards. And that's a little different in TIC Council compared to, to EBSCA because here also the scheme holders um, are, are, are stakeholders or members and stakeholders. And that's so important to jointly define it, to come to a standard which is acceptable at the end by the society. And that's why I wish you now for, uh, I, I heard already you had good discussions yesterday and the day before. Um, and hopefully also at least those who have been here in the room have the chance to go to the Christmas markets. That's not possible online, um, but uh, that's what you're missing. And maybe next time uh, then also those who are online or at least a few of them have the opportunity to join in because I, that's my experience, the best discussions you mainly have in the evening when you're at a Christmas market or at a party. With this, I don't want to uh, talk any more to you. Um, 
I welcome you here uh, in Cologne and online, and I wish you a further good conference. And I just want to tell you, you are important. What you are doing is important as EBSCA, as association, to ensure the integrity of not just the tech industry, but of the whole industry, also of the buyers, to support the sustainability of the world. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you very much, Dr. Fubi. We really appreciate those words. And, and it's also good to be reminded about our, our history. Um, also, if you haven't had a chance already, if you are out in the hall, and again, this is for the people that are in the room, if you're out in the hallway, you can see um, uh, two Vrindlands history. You've got a great display out there. It is actually two Vrindlands 150th birthday. So congratulations on celebrating birthday anniversary. Um, but do take a moment if you have a chance to read the, the information out there. So a couple of things I just want to start with. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to sometimes forget that, that APSCA as an organization is the sixth attempt by the industry to professionalize. And it's only been five years since we launched our very first code of, code of um, conduct, as well as our competency framework. It's only been four years since we launched the very first exam at the end of 2018 in English, both Chinese languages and Spanish. Three years ago, which is our actual last in-person meeting, we announced our first 42 certified auditors, which at that time represented 1% of our total membership. We also at that same meeting announced the first three full um, APSCA member firms. Um, it's the second year, or it's been two years ago, last year, since we offered our first round of CPD for our auditors. And this year, we're providing up to 10 hours of CPD credit for our auditors through this week's of sessions. That's about a third of the total amount of CPD hours that auditors require to meet APSCA's expectations. On Tuesday, we had a panel which was talking about the use of APSCA numbers, and we had um, four collaborative programs in person, and we had one additional collaborative program that provided feedback because they were unable to join on the day, which talked about why they believe that using APSCA member firms and then also APSCA member auditors is so important to their program. And I'll just keep moving slides. Um, our membership continues to grow and now includes over 4,800 auditors and it's located in 105 countries. Our auditors speak more than 90 languages and they participate in more than 200 different audit programs globally. Our auditor membership has increased just 3% since September already. So it is a growing market and we are getting more and more auditors into the profession. And since we were here in Cologne back in 2017, we have grown more than 90%. Our CSCAs also continue to grow, rising from just 1% in 2019 to 36% on a growing base. Our, auditor, our certified auditors are located in 59 countries, so more than 50% of our countries that we have auditors located in now have a certified auditor. And it's a bit hard to read some of these. We will be making the, the decks public for you, but you can see there's a, a number of countries up there, you know, Uruguay, Sweden, Mauritius, probably a few countries that people may be surprised that we actually have certified auditors in them. Our member firms have also continued to grow. We started off with nine founding audit firm members in 2015, and we have 55 members today. We have three that were recently accepted and intending to uh, complete their enrollment in the beginning of the year. Since we launched our exam in December, 2018, we'd held over 2000 exams in 2019 and more than four and a half thousand this year. So we've done a total of over 15,000 exams since we started. We've upgraded our website, particularly our resource library and our supporting documentation for our auditors as they prepare for the exam. We have webinars, we have practice exams, exam guides, how to read your results and more that are available on our resource library for your support. We've also enhanced our communication. We've added to our newsletter. We've got specific communication that goes for auditors as well as specific communication that goes for our firms because we wanna ensure that we're getting the message to you. We continue to enhance our social media and have developed a calendar for 2023. So you'll be hearing a lot more for us in the near future. Our website's views have continued to grow from 1500 um, views a week in 2017 to more than three and a half thousand every week. In 2021, 73% of our auditors were employed in the profession, 
And as of this year, 86% of our certified auditors are employed by a member firm. This data continues to, continues to show how much our profession has grown, the success of our members, and the culmination of this are the special guests that we have throughout our panels, both on Tuesday as well as today. Tomorrow, we actually have a training that's taking place with the OECD, and we've got about 700 auditors that have signed up to participate in that training. OECD were really hoping for about 200 odd, and so they've had to, they had to go back and sort of rethink how they were going to do the training a little bit differently to accommodate the great um, enthusiasm that they've received. So we appreciate everybody's support on that. We do want to congratulate everybody for being part of this success and by continuing to challenge the professional standards body of ABSCA. It's your, your challenges that really do help make us a better organization and ensure that we continue to focus and meet your needs. Oh, did I go the wrong way? Sorry, there we go. So like our theme, ABSCA continues to focus on transforming the future of social compliance auditing. We're focused on continuous improvement and we have regular discussions on how we can improve to better support our members. I'd like to stress when it comes to our auditors and the exam, we really encourage you to focus on planning for success. Don't budget for failure, but plan for success. It was with this in mind that our ABSCA pillar leads developed their presentations last week. Um, I encourage you, if you haven't participated or listened to them already, please log in to our YouTube channel and all of our presentations are located there. We recognize with our broad auditor base that there's no perfect time for everybody. So we recorded them, made them available for everybody. And there's a contact details in each one of those presentations. So you know the right person to raise your questions to. Um, we did have a QA session. Um, we had over 400 people participate across the two different um, sessions that we held and we received more than 200 questions. So please, we were here. The team are focused on what else they can do to continue to address the questions and issues that were raised, as well as continue to be planning for success. The APSCA team actually developed um, at the beginning of this year, a document which is titled How to Book. Um, it's probably not the best title because it really is how to book and how to prepare for the exam. It provides you in a one pager links for how to test your equipment, um, download the, the, the software to use for translation if you need that. It provides links to various supporting documentations to help you prepare. We recognize that preparing for the exam can be quite a stressful situation. You're working, you're getting ready for an exam, you, you know, want to be spending time with your family and friends as well. So we've tried to turn what used to be an email blast that had about 10 documents attached into a one pager to help support. You'll notice where the little green dots are. Those are where um, the, a lot of the hyperlinks are to the documents that you, you should use or the practice exams that we encourage you to use in order of part of your preparation. We launched at the beginning of the year, the part one and part two practice exams. And as a result of that and the uptake of that, we've seen the um, auditors go up to about a 65, 70% pass rate in part one and part two. They really do work. And whilst the questions, you're not going to find those same questions on the part one and part two exam, but they're similar questions. They're the same style of questions. You can get the feel for what the questions look like. Strongly encourage if you are using alternate language to practice with your right click translate as well, because you can go back and forth between English and, um, and your nominated language. We're also in the final stages of a video for part three. Um, we've done a number of pilots um, with a video on part three to try and come up with something that's going to truly help. I know a lot of people are, you know, looking for what actually happens in the exam and actually seeing that one-on-one -on -one interview. We found that when we were providing an exact interview or, you know, a, an extrapolation of an interview, that people tried to emulate that in their next exam and they didn't perform as well. So we've taken a slightly different approach to the practice exam for part three, and it, it goes right through talking about, you know, where some of the areas of opportunity um, that we see when you're going through the exam, where some of the um, maybe oversights or, or challenging areas that people have been experiencing. So we're trying to help you along that journey, but it, it really is bringing together all of your experience as being an auditor into that examination process. We've also enhanced the feedback mechanism for all the exams throughout the years and a lot of, or, yeah, th this year in particular, and a lot of that has come as a result of comment and feedback that we've received from our auditors. We truly do value that feedback um, and we are constantly working with our IT team to see how we can improve um, at the way that we provide information to you. 
We recognize that the information that comes out of the exam is, is valuable, whether you're passing or whether you do need to resit it, because there is another exam, or there's also CPD. We're all continually learning and enhancing our knowledge skills. We're also adding more information on our continuous professional development or our CPD page of our website to link you up with various trainings that are available around the world, as well as we're continuing to get more and more people that are providing training courses um, in through our CDP team um, to be noted on your, on your page if you're uh, doing recognized training, make it easier for you to upload that information. If you have any team members that haven't been able to join this week, if they do schedule, uh, register to uh, sign up, they'll be able to receive the links to the recording. And so they still can participate and get some CPD training if they're looking on that. APSCA is also focused on emerging issues affecting our profession. And we've been working with an external consultant and we've mapped out an external affairs policy um, that, to um, talk about our strategy and planning for the next three to five years. So we do have a session later today with representatives from our executive board. Um, and we'll talk about the strategy and the next steps of our, in, uh, developing the plan for implementation um, in our last session today. In conclusion, I want to paraphrase again Harriet Tubman, together we can build a better profession and reach the stars and change the world. I want to thank you again for your support, and I also want to thank you for your participation throughout the day as we continue to learn together. I now would like to welcome a very special guest. I'm very excited about Martine being here today. Martine hosted a panel I was on a few years ago, and it was just so exciting to work with her. I think she'd be fantastic to participate with us. So I want to um, welcome Martine Croxell. She's a leading TV journalist from the UK. Martine is one of the main presenters for the BBC News and BBC World News TV channels. She joined the BBC News in May of 20, uh, 2001, and she covered every major news story in that time. It fell to Martine to announce the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip in April of 21 on all of BBC's domestic and international English speaking channels. She was also on air when the terror attacks took place in London and Paris, and of the latter, former CBS News Bureau Chief David Henderson wrote, she was live to a global television audience of millions, nonstop for two and a half hours. Her demeanor was extraordinary, free of drama, showbiz type, um, showbiz hype and tawdry behavior that we endure <clears throat> for many television newcasters in America. It's been decades since I've witnessed such a high level of journalistic professionalism. It was downright exciting. She began her broadcasting career in the BBC local radio and regional TV, where she worked in various roles, including producer, reporter, presenter, and news editor. Martine's a sought after event host, debate moderator, and executive presenter skills coach. She also trains new TV presenters for the BBC's Academy. Martine grew up in rural Leicester, went to school in Coventry, studied geography at the University of Leeds, and is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. That was a surprise to me. <laughs> she has two grown children and a beloved rescue dog called Bo. In her spare time, Martine enjoys long walks, dancing, and painting. Martine's going to share her thoughts with us on public trust and what it means to the social compliance profession. Welcome, Martine. Sounds so impressive, doesn't it, when it's set out like that, condensed. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Ronna, very much for the invitation, uh, for being here today. I've uh, come to Cologne at the right time to see all the Christmas markets and spend lots of money. Um, for those of you in the room, I'd just like to start with one or two questions, if I may. Uh, you see, I have people to do this sort of thing for me. Yeah. Show of hands, if you would. Who has heard of the BBC? Whew. Have you ever watched or listened to what we do or read anything that we do? Oh, excellent. Do you trust the BBC? Oh, I saw a hand from Frank like this. That's slightly worrying. Anyway, um, so... This is where I work. This is New Broadcasting House. This is the headquarters of the BBC in London. 
I think I have one of the best jobs there is in the world. And the BBC is an extraordinary organisation. You would never invent the BBC today because it makes no sense at all. Uh, it doesn't make much commercial sense really either, um, but it does mean that we are free most of the time to make really amazing programmes. I am used to being the one who asks all the questions, so it's slightly uncomfortable for me to be up here, but later I will very happily answer your questions, whether you're in the room or whether you're watching online about this presentation or the BBC in general. Uh, today, I would like to talk about transparency, trust, sweaters, and soup. It will make sense in a while. I joined the BBC 31 years ago. Um, I'd been to university, I traveled through Africa, and then I thought I'd better get a job. And they very kindly let me into the building. And I've been there ever since, or different buildings ever since. This is my current staff pass, which lets me into the building. And on the back of it, it's a bit grubby, I'm afraid, um, are a set of six values. And they set out what the BBC stands for, and what audiences can expect from us, and what we as employees should be able to expect from each other and from managers. So first of all, audiences, this, this is the most important thing. Without audiences, we would be talking to ourselves. What audiences want from us is the only place to start. Without creativity, we're just repeating ideas and there's nothing new and that would be really dull. Without creativity, uh, sorry, without trust, why would anybody engage with us? But being trustworthy is only the start of it. These days, lots of organizations are realizing more and more that they have to demonstrate why they can be trusted and how they go about fostering that trust. And I'm going to explain more about why the BBC thinks that's essential and how we're doing it. Uh, respect is kind of a given. It's not always as evident as you would hope, but it should be there. Accountable. We must accept scrutiny of what we do and how we do it. The BBC comes in for a lot of criticism. We have to explain why we do things all the time. And when we get it wrong, we should acknowledge it. And this is how hopefully we learn and we improve. And this, I think, is a, a fundamental aspect of trust and transparency, two issues that are very much at the forefront of BBC thinking in 2022. And one BBC, this is a great strength. I think that I work with people who all understand why we turn up for work every day. Why we do something is immensely powerful and it transcends what we do and how we do it. So the BBC celebrated its 100th birthday last month. Its mission to inform, educate and entertain was first propounded by John Reith, who was uh, the first Director General, later Lord Reith. Uh, from the beginning, he fought off attempts by politicians to influence the BBC. And that mission remains the same today. And the BBC's independence from government remains vital. Our audiences rightly count on us for a great range of high quality programs and they expect us to act with integrity and so broadcasters work in line with this book. It's called BBC Editorial Guidelines and they represent the wisdom of the last 100 years of program making distilled into a single volume. At 400 pages of best practice, it's an immensely important book You'll find it in all of our newsrooms and program making offices, and we rely on it constantly. Presiding over it, sort of interpreting it, are uh, some of our most senior managers and lawyers who are available to be consulted 24 hours a day if we have a problem or a query. The guidelines provide the justification for some of the very challenging things that we are sometimes required to do. They cover sensitive issues such as harm and offence, safeguarding and privacy. On privacy, any intrusion into someone's privacy must be outweighed by the public interest. For example, permission for secret recordings has to be sought from the highest level. And even then, it must be the most minimum necessary and always proportionate. We can get into a lot of trouble if we get that wrong. And when complaints arise, and they do, uh, there's a published set of procedures um, for handling 
those complaints and resolution internally and externally by our broadcaster and organization called Ofcom. So you might be asking yourself, why is a TV presenter standing in front of us, supply chain auditors, talking about mission statements, BBC values and editorial guidelines? What's the relevance? Well, what I'm driving at is the importance of protecting and promoting public trust. Now, the concept of public trust dates back to the origins of democratic government. Its seminal idea is that within the public lies the true power and future of our society. If we're a democracy, we get to vote, we should be able to change things. But public trust has become wider than that over time, and it's a concern beyond politics. And it matters to the BBC, matters to APSCA, it matters to auditors, it matters to businesses that you're all working with. So when a company commissions a compliance audit, it's trying to verify whether a production house, a factory, a farm, a packaging facility complies with the social and ethical responsibilities, the health and safety regulations and the labour laws that the business is subject to or believes are important. That business in all likelihood tells its customers via its website usually that it makes every effort to protect the health and safety and rights of workers in their supply chains in the community that they're working in, in the environment they're operating in. It probably doesn't, though, explain very in very detail, much detail, how it goes about doing this. And I think it might be missing an opportunity. Some companies might regard compliance as an unnecessary evil that hinders their business. Some don't bother with it at all. They might see it as a burden and a cost, but it is increasingly important for a brand's success and in the long run could save its reputation. And that is in keeping with what some of the BBC is thinking, that we need to be a successful brand and we need to have a strong reputation. After all, we can all think of examples, I'm sure, of where businesses have come in for scrutiny and quite rightly, sometimes criticism. It makes it into the news, for example, when there's forced labor found in supply chains or where environmental damage has occurred because of poor practices and safeguards and flouting of laws. As the American business magnate, investor and philanthropist Warren Buffett said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And I think the public is becoming increasingly aware of corporate social responsibility and that in turn influences their buying habits. According to research, published by, am I going on to the next one or not? No, not, not quite, not ready yet. According to um, research that was uh, cited by Harvard Business School that was uh, commissioned by the US insurance firm Aflac, last year, 77% of customers said that they were motivated to purchase from companies committed to making the world a better place. 73% of investors say that efforts to improve the environment and society contribute to their investment decisions. So social compliance and the public's trust in it can affect the bottom line. But I would argue it's about more than a contract. It's more than profit. It's more than money changing hands for goods or services. I think efforts to bolster public trust, such as through social compliance methods, are more akin to a covenant. Whereas a contract is an agreement between parties, a covenant is a pledge. A contract is an agreement you can break, while a covenant is a perpetual promise. You seal a covenant, covenant you sign a contract. A contract is mutually beneficial. A co covenant, though, is something you propose to fulfill. So, for example, a customer buys an electronic toy from a supermarket at an agreed price. The assumption is that uh, it will uh, meet the prevailing safety standards and will be in good working order. That's the contract. But that supermarket has also assured its customers, probably via its website, that it takes its corporate responsibilities seriously. It probably promotes it widely, but it's a voluntary commission of a social order. It doesn't have to do these things. It could turn a blind eye to underage labor and excessive working hours. But when it chooses to do what is ethically right for human beings and places in the supply chain, even when it's not compelled to do that, 
even when no one is looking, it is in effect fulfilling a covenant. And in the best cases, with the help of social compliance auditors, it may use those findings as an opportunity to make improvements to what's happening in those supply chains. Now, in the case of the BBC, in exchange for our license fee or our subscription, audiences have access to our television channels, our radio stations, our websites. That's the contract. But our stated values that I shared with you a little while ago, they make up that promise or that covenant that stands alone from and supersedes any fees that you pay over any month or in any year. So central, so, so in fact, so central is trust to that commitment. The BBC has now begun a transparency drive to boost trust. And we're having to get used to that as employees of the BBC. We're not really used to it. We're just used to doing what we do and hoping that everybody just takes our word for it, that this is a good idea. But increasingly people are asking for more than that. Because we're living in, as you know, what's been described as a post-truth age where so-called alternative facts, fake news and disinformation compete with, for our attention. Perhaps they're there to deceive us, to influence us, and sometimes they're there because of political motives. The origins of these stories and the claims that they make are often very murky. Certainly little evidence if any at all, is offered up to prove that those stories are true, but they can appear very credible. I'm alarmed at how many young people, for example, don't seem to have been given the critical skills to work out what's true and what's not, to, which to older gener generations hopefully will be, but people of any age seem to be taken in. The adage goes, a lie's halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on. Um, that quote's attributed to all the wrong suspects, you know, the usual Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, Oscar Wilde. We have, in fact, Virgil to thank for the origins of this adage. Um, he actually said, rumour, more than whom no other evil thing is faster, but it's sort of been updated and got boots. Um, social media platforms have served to accelerate the speed with which a hoax can spread around the world. Conventional newspapers, television, and other sources of news that most people would probably know about, like the BBC, have in the past been regarded as reliable, finding themselves battling against a decline in trust. This is some uh, UK data from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. It was published in June last year. It's not a great looking map, uh, graph, is it? It's quite a worry that the, the trust in print media in particular uh, fell very sharply over the past five years. But broadcast news media, which is what we see here, these are all broadcasting uh, names in the UK, if you're not familiar with them, they suffered a decline too. The BBC saw a 20% drop in trust since 2018. And that was even though we were the go-to source of information for so many people during the pandemic in the UK and around the world. However, the fall from 75% to 55% still leaves the BBC as the most trusted news brand in the UK alongside our competitor, which is ITV, which is a commercial organisation. Nobody is complacent about this decline at all. The film I'm going to play you now uh, shows audiences, hopefully, why they can afford to put their trust in our journalism. It brings to life the BBC's editorial values, the guidelines that I showed you a moment ago, and it showcases what drives and guides accurate and impartial reporting that we hope will be trusted by viewers and listeners around the world. It's really fake news. Just now, Ukraine's getting Minister, BBC. Are they going to get past you, or are they going to get past you? And these are women. How 
soon do you think it could be before there is a real fight in here? I just did. what you think of him how do you sit across the table to try to stop the war you may recognize some of the people that are in that um, film they're some of our most extraordinary foreign correspondents and war correspondents and um they've worked very, very hard over the years to sort of maintain the BBC's reputation because we're not trying to just shore up our own individual reputations, but something, a brand that goes around the world and it's so easily spoiled. Our Director General, the Big Boss, has uh, recently renewed our emphasis on the need for the BBC to be impartial. So the idea being that the output will remain hopefully universal into uh, in its appeal to people of every opinion because in the UK if you want to access television you have to have a license fee that license fee funds the BBC so if you're funding something you want to get something from it our new head of news who only joined us from a commercial rival in September has launched a new push for greater transparency journalists are being encouraged to show their workings to explain how we gather material for our stories and that's why we've made this this film that I just showed you it's a basic requirement that everybody knows that a reporter will have to have at least two sources for a story. That's especially important when those sources are going to remain anonymous. Uh, but we're going to go further than that. We're lifting the lid on our global news operation, how we check facts, how we verify video footage, the painstaking efforts sometimes that go into geolocating where recordings have come from. It takes a very long time. Cross-referencing social media posts, foreign language experts who monitor the media around the world, listening in sometimes to communications between uh, governments, and, and their public. These methods have produced award-winning pieces of investigation in some of the most underreported parts of the world, some of the most secret, secretive parts of the world. We also have um, a reality check team, an entire team of people who are dedicated to trying to clear up fake news and false stories that, to find that elusive thing called the truth. These journalists examine claims that are made by politicians, by businesses, and people with vested interests. Uh, and these are some of the issues that we've been exploring uh, recently. Uh, it's very time consuming. They are kept very busy indeed. Um, you might understand, some of the stories will be really familiar to you about Giorgia Maloney, um, who's, uh, who won uh, the election in Italy not so long ago, um, when we were hearing that up to 15,000 people might be at risk of being put to death in Iran. Um, but then there are some um, issues which are very British to do with uh, the cost of living crisis, to do with uh, whether people are really earning what the government will say public sector workers earn. It's not always quite as clear as they might make out. In uh, March 2020, the BBC appointed its first specialist disinformation reporter to debunk some of the pernicious conspiracy theories that abound online. It won't surprise you, unfortunately, to hear that she receives a huge amount of abuse for the work that she does. A lot of threats come her way. Um, the purpose of all of this is so that we don't assume that people know how we work. We don't assume that they will anymore take our word for something, for something that it checks out, that it's true. Contemporary news consumers are highly media literate, have myriad choices and access to multiple news outlets. So it, they're more than capable of doing their own cross-checking for themselves. By being transparent, the hope is that the BBC will be more trusted by the public and we'll see that graph going up again. So it made me wonder, talking to you, how much more transparent com companies could be about the audits they commission and what they find in those social compliance audits? Would it help to improve that precious commodity of public trust? 
in my experience, it can be quite hard sometimes to pin down exactly what sort of due diligence a business is doing. And sharing that information, I think, would help me make a much better choice and it would make me a more loyal customer. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this in a moment because I realize that it isn't risk free. And an example from my own sort of buying habits are that a couple of years ago, I wanted to buy quite an expensive woolen sweater. I promised you I'd talk about sweaters. Here's the story. It took me three emails and a phone call to determine what was, where the source of their wool was. And they couldn't guarantee me that the wool that they sourced from Australia wasn't subjected to cruel shearing practices where they basically they stripped the back end off the, the sheep in the hope of avoiding fly strike. And the animal is so traumatized and so damaged that infection sets in anyway, and the fly, fly strike happens anyway. And then the animal, even if it survives, it goes through weeks and weeks of extraordinary pain. So I didn't buy the sweater. I wasn't going to ever buy the sweater until I knew the source of the wool. And when I found out what the source of the wool was, I didn't buy the sweater. And I told them why. And I explained that I couldn't, once you know something, you can't unknow it. So I just said, I can't, I can't buy it. If you can sort out your sourcing, I'll come back to you. But it shouldn't be that difficult. That transparency, I think, should be right there. And I can't be alone in thinking that businesses and you as social compliance uh, auditors would get a lot more credit for the effort you're making to try to protect the people in the, your supply chains. Explain the processes involved, be honest about what's going right, what's going wrong. I just think we all need to be a bit more grown up. We need to have that conversation. If you don't look for something, you can't find it. If you can't find the problem, you can't fix it. I do realize though that it can be very difficult as a business being transparent when you do find things that are uncomfortable. Um, but you, businesses, I believe, really should be given huge amounts of uh, respect and custom for being transparent. If genuine steps are really being taken to root out that sort of malpractice, if workers' voices are being amplified and environments are being conserved. I think greater clarity and detail would remove some of that doubt that's being done. I mean, there's a huge amount of good work being done, isn't there? As uh, Dr. Furby said at the beginning, you know, you're doing really good work. I would really like to hear more about it. I think it could be uh, proof that audits really make a difference if you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. It has to be weighed and, and realized with the risk involved to your to your business, but. That's the comparison, that transparency can breed trust. That's certainly what we're trying to do at the BBC. I said at the start, I talked to you about trust, transparency, sweaters and soup. I've talked to you about the sweaters. I've certainly talked to you about trust and transparency. So I conclude with a quote from a woman who once ran the world's biggest, one of the world's biggest soup companies, Campbell's Soup. Denise Morrison believed that customers had a right to know the provenance of what they were eating. What were they putting in those famous cans that Andy Warhol immortalized? She said the single most important ingredient in the recipe for success is transparency because transparency builds trust. As true for many things as it is for soup. Thank you. So I think we have seven minutes for people if they want to ask questions. Have we got questions on Slido as well, Andrea? Okay. That's fine. Absolutely fine. If, if we have a few minutes for questions, I started early and I've probably gone, gone on longer than I was supposed to. So if anyone has any questions, please ask. Yes. I think people, sorry, sorry, yes. What's been the, what's been the main cause of the, the drop in trust in the media right now? I think it's the proliferation of um, alternative sources of news, which tell you something different. And it, it's tempting, isn't it, to believe the things that you want to be true? Um, 
facts are really inconvenient sometimes. They force you to have to sort of change your, your view of the world. And I think when you, you're given access to information which may not be accurate, it can sway people's views. And it's at odds what, what the alternative media are doing compared with the conventional media. I won't call them mainstream media because that's what conspiracy theorists call us. But if, if the two don't marry, people are, are not sure what they can trust. And I think it's that proliferation, which can be, you know, um, plurality is usually a good thing, particularly in the media. But I think it's because you, you're now getting access to uh, sources of information which may not be as reliable, but it messes with your head a bit and you think, well, who, who should I trust? I believe that's why. Wait for a microphone. Keep you fit, Ronna. I knew I needed more steps up today. <laughs> I, um, I have one question in regards to um, how do you counter fake news or let's say alternate facts? Um, for example, if we take the rocket that flew into Poland, um, the first inf news that were coming up were kind of, they were Russian, then they were Ukrainian, then it's uh, someone said, no, it's just laid there. It was just placed there um, for instability um so how can can you being on air counter that uh, information and say okay transparency and transparency builds trust but how can we can we trust you telling us the truth because that's what the other half of these weird guys um, think sometimes it's as simple as saying we don't know yet it's the temptation when you're on air and it's live and breaking news is to try to be the first all the time. But you can be the first and wrong and then you've wrecked your the trust people have in you. So when I was on air during the the Paris attacks of 2015, some and it just showed just how unreliable social media is. In the end, I switched Twitter off because it was just extremely unhelpful. Um, people sending thoughts and prayers all the time. That's no help to me whatsoever. There's a piece of footage that was um, circulating on Twitter uh, from the jungle, which was um, a refugee camp that sprung up near Calais. And they've tried to close it many, many times. It keeps springing up again because people will do what people feel they need to do to have a safe life and try to get to, to Britain. Um, there was a fire in the jungle, in the camp. And the suggestion was that because it looked like some kind of terrorism was happening in Paris, and at the time we still didn't know whether it were, were, they were terrorist acts or not, uh, the suggestion was made that this fire was set deliberately as some kind of retribution, some kind of retaliation against migrants. It turned out to be old footage. So I had to come back on air and say, those reports that we just told you about the jungle, they were wrong. It was old footage. It hasn't just happened. We need to set that to one side. It would have actually been much better if we hadn't have run with that video footage at all and we'd have verified it first. So just say, we don't know. And that's what should have happened with rockets going into Poland. Because until you can be sure, I mean, you can set off a diplomatic incident. You can stoke, you know, violence. You can stoke all sorts of problems if you're not right. So we're being encouraged to say, we don't know yet, rather than being forced into being first and being wrong. I hope that helps. Martin, uh, always a pleasure hearing from you and thank you so much for these remarks. Uh, I really uh, appreciate and agree with the parallel you're drawing in some ways between the work journalists do and the work auditors do in terms of gathering information firsthand, <laughs> validating, verifying it. Um, and of course, I think the quote you have left us with about transparency being the foundation for trust is, is true. The challenge, and I preface this by saying, I know this is a difficult question, uh, is uh, in certain situations, and auditors, for example, dealing with confidential, you know, proprietary information in the facilities they audit, or reporters dealing with sources that need for their own safety to remain anonymous, uh, don't allow for full transparency. No. Uh, so where does one draw that line? As I said, I know it's a difficult question. And how does one weigh uh, the, the 
individual rights or the confidentiality information versus the public need for transparency in order to have the trust to rely on that information. Yeah, indeed, and I've got to be quick because I realize I'm running out of time. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, journalists go to jail rather than betray their sources. It's about make, making sure that you have done all the due diligence you can. And we double source everything. We have to have two sources. Just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean that you're going to report it. So we double source it. And it might not be exact confirmation, but you sort of try, you have to triangulate where did it happen? Who's telling me this? What reputation does this organization have? What's their track record? And so you, you have to sort of bring all of those pieces together. And in the end, it's it's a judgment call, isn't it? Um, but we want, if, if you can do all of those things and increasingly, in some ways it becomes more difficult because the world's more complicated, but technology helps us out a huge amount with things like you know geolocating where a tweet was sent from or where some film was recorded. So it's about, I think it, it's about having multiple sources that you can rely upon. I think I have to stop because we have to have three minutes between three minutes. now and then. Thank you very much for your questions and thank you for listening.